This seminar is for educational purposes only. It is not a substitute for professional medical advice or treatment. Consult with your medical provider for medical advice or treatment. Although the presenters try to keep the information in this seminar as accurate and timely as possible, the speakers and Mather Hospital assume no duty to ensure the seminar is error-free. The speakers and Mather Hospital are not responsible or liable for any claim, loss, or damage resulting from you viewing this seminar. Good afternoon and thank you for joining us today for our Healthy You webinar. Is weight loss surgery an option for you? At any time during the presentation, please feel free to enter any questions you may have using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We will answer as many questions as we can within the time allotted once the presentation concludes. Your questions will remain anonymous as always. Dr. Arif Ahmad is recognized as one of the country's top bariatric surgeons. He is board certified. He's a board certified surgeon with extensive fellowship training in advanced laparoscopic surgery, including bariatric surgery. He specializes in all areas of bariatric surgery, including laparoscopic sleeve gastrectomy, gastric bypass, gastric banding, revisional bariatric surgery, and others. He's an expert in minimally invasive surgery using small incisions that result in minimal pain, less scarring, and shorter recovery. He has completed fellowships in the U.S. and the United Kingdom, including the Fellowship of the Royal College of Surgeons, an advanced fel training fellowship at Harvard Medical School, a five-year residency at the University of Connecticut, and an advanced laparoscopic surgery fellow fellowship at the University of Virginia. He has taught other doctors how to perform bariatric surgery at Stony Brook University and was a founder of the Department of Bariatric Surgery at Mather Hospital. He's also the director of the Robotic Center of Excell Excellence at Mather Hospital Northwell Health. Dr. Maud, you can go ahead and get us started. All right, thank you um, for that introduction, Emily. So um, the reason we wanted to do this presentation today is we wanted to discuss, um, you know, what are the options for people who've been trying and trying to lose weight and they're either not able to, or they lose it and they gain it back. So we're going to discuss whether minimally invasive surgery, that means uh, you know, um, surgery with the small incisions is a good option for patients who have morbid obesity, which means they have obesity often with associated health problems that obesity causes. And some of these are things like diabetes and sleep apnea, joint pains, severe acid reflux, breathing problems, et cetera. So um, uh, the logo there, you see there, um, right here is a logo. And this is the logo that I invented when I founded the Bariatric Surgery Center of Excellence here at Mather. Prior to that, I was working for Stony Brook. And then I came out um, into private practice and I, I opened this, uh, you know, the, um, the, the center that we currently have at Mather. This was started in 2004. And uh, the logo there, you know, you see the darker, the darker figure is is, um, is the person trying to come out. And the lighter figure there is you trapped in your weight and you're trying to come out and we are releasing you. You see that, that wand kind of thing, the circle, we are releasing you. But after you're released, you still have that shadow, which you can see at the background next to the light shadow. There's a shadow there. That's the shadow trying to come back, which means, uh, you know, the patients who suffer from morbid obesity after they're treated for this condition and they get better, there's always this shadow of their weight which persists in their minds. And there's always a possibility of the weight coming back. And therefore one has to make a concerted effort to prevent that. So, um, so, so surgery really is just a tool. It's a tool that enables you to succeed. So it's a tool that would enable you to lose your weight and keep it off. Surgery is not a quick fix. It doesn't solve the problem by itself. But what it does is it provides you with a tool that helps you to fight the disease of obesity. Next slide. So obesity is not a new problem. This is from Willendorf. Willendorf is a place in Austria, and this is many, many years ago. You know, this is actually 22,000 years ago. Next slide. However, there's been an evolution to the problem on the left side is 2000 BC, and on the right side is today, 2000 AD, 2020 AD. 
Uh, but seriously, next slide. Um, this is a big problem. You know, there's a big epidemic of obesity going on, as you know, one in five people in America are, are obese and three in five Americans are either overweight or obese. And in the past 20 years, obesity has doubled. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the things that, um, you know, I think has great relevance in this, um, in, in consideration for surgical intervention for obesity is the degree of obesity. So, you know, we could check degrees of obesity by saying, okay, how, how heavy a person is. And when you look at a ratio of their weight with the height, um, it's really ratio of height with body surface, uh, weight with body surface area. However, um, you know, the, that ratio is called the BMI or body mass index. So patients who are morbidly obese have a BMI of 40 or more. And I think if you have the BMI charts there, um, you know, with you, then you would be able to tell. But basically a BMI of 40 means being 100 pounds above your ideal body weight. So patients who are 100 pounds above their ideal body weight are considered candidates for surgery, which means surgery is considered medically necessary for patients who are 100 pounds above their ideal body weight or have a BMI of 40, even if they don't have any health problems. Now, the other group is those who have some health problems and their BMI is between 35 and 40. They're also considered medically necessary and surgery is covered by insurances, most insurances for this group. That means groups between 35 and 40 with a comorbidity, that means with diabetes, sleep apnea, or hypertension, or a BMI of 40 with no comorbidity. Of course, they could have a comorbidity as well, but even if they don't have a comorbidity. So then we come into the group of patients who are obese, but they're not considered severely obese. Is surgery considered medically necessary? And and the insurance companies do not recognize surgery to be medically necessary for that group. However, we do consider surgery to be a tool that can be used to fight the disease and its associated health problems, especially if there's a comorbidity in that group. Next one. Obesity affects every organ in your body from your head to your toe. And this is really no exaggeration. You know, we start with idiopathic intracranial hypertension, which means problems with you know, the pressure within the brain, which can cause severe headaches and it can cause vision issues, strokes, cataracts, coronary heart disease, which is diseases of the heart interfering with blood flow. And then lung problems, including difficulty breathing, uh, sleep apnea, um, and then liver problems. You know, there's the, uh, there's the uh, fatty liver, which is called steatohepatitis, which can progress to cirrhosis. And of course, there's diabetes and high blood pressure and gallbladder problems and even colon problems. You know, colon cancer is higher in patients who are morbidly obese, as well as breast cancer and uh, uterine cancer. A lot of cancers are associated with obesity. And of course, there are gynecological abnormalities and then there are joint problems and skin problems and vein problems, as well as, you know, things like gout. Next slide, please. Uh, one of the problems with patients who are morbidly obese is that a lot of the diseases that the people who are obese have are like catch-22, which means as the disease gets worse, the obesity gets worse. But when the obesity gets worse, it makes the disease worse. For example, when your joints hurt, you want to move less. Now, when you move less, it makes you more obese. But when you get more obese, then your joints hurt even more. And this becomes a vicious cycle. Same for sleep apnea. Patients who have sleep apnea, when they wake up, they're already exhausted. They're not thinking, I'm feeling so energetic, let's go for a jog. They're thinking, I don't know how I'm going to get through my day. And so they want to move less. They move less, they get more obese. They get more obese, the sleep apnea gets worse. And then the joints start hurting even more. And then diabetes kicks in, you know, so there's all this, all these other things that are really forming the vicious cycle of obesity and, um, and its associated comorbidities that feed into each other. And that's what makes obesity such a difficult problem to tackle. Next one. And that's what's going on in your body. But what's going on in the mind is when patients are obese, they have a negative self-image. They want to get more isolated. They get more isolated, they eat to feel good. They get more obese and they get a worse self-image. And this is the cycle of obesity, and this goes on. And patients who take antidepressants at this point, uh, many of them, you know, they get more obese because many antidepressants are associated with weight gain. Next one. And meanwhile, 
obesity reduces one's length of life by 10 to 14 years, 10 to 12, it says here, you know, it reduces your life expectancy because it affects the quality of life and causes severe disadvantages. So, uh, so the damage goes on as time progresses. Next one. And these things increase many times as the weight increases. And compared to people with normal weight, you know, people who are obese have a 50 to 100% increased risk of dying prematurely and the risk of death rises with increasing weight. Um, and simple tasks are difficult for people who are morbidly obese, you know, say it's normal tasks become harder, movement is more difficult, you know, these things already, um, you actually face them more than, you know, than I can ap even appreciate. Next one. And there's a lot of prejudice against the morbidly obese. Next one. And a lot of this is not even justified, you know, we all know that there are people who eat what they want and they don't exercise and yet they, and, and yet they remain skinny and other people on the same diet and exercise will gain weight. So there's, it's a multifactorial background that results in obesity. It's a combination of genetics with, you know, hunger, which is controlled by different hormones. Um, you know, the hormones that control hunger and satiety, there's an imbalance in that. There's an effect on the metabolism, which affects the way we, we use energy, the way we store off, off energy as fat. And, and these are all controlled by different hormones. And the disease of morbid obesity is actually where these hormones have gone, you know, into, a, into an imbalance. And this actually triggers a lot of the things that we see in patients who are morbidly obese. See, this baby is not, um, you know, he's got a predisposition to obesity. How many 14 year olds would you see? Like the picture on the right, you know? And how many 14 year olds could be like that even if they tried, not many. Next one. And, and of course, there's also the microbiome, we call it, that means the gut flora. And this is a little bit more complicated for the general, um, you know, for the general audience. However, there, there are other factors that result in obesity. Next one. And uh, next one. And uh, next one. Okay, next one. And we know since 1992 that diet and obese, that diet and exercise don't do it for people who are 100 pounds above their ideal body weight because with diet and exercise alone, most people regain most of the weight that they've lost within one or two years, once they're 100 pounds above their ideal body weight. And all those other things, they do help, like dietary intervention, physical activity, and you know, behavior modification. But unfortunately, the reality is that those things don't result in sustained weight loss. Next one. Okay, now I'm going to discuss the, um, the common procedures that we do for morbid obesity. So the first one is called the sleeve gastrectomy. The first one, which is on the left of your screen. Um, and um, you can see there that the, the, the organ there is the liver. And then below the liver is the, um, is the stomach. If you can use the pointer to get to the stomach, Karina, there you go. And, and that part of the stomach that we remove, the part that is lighter, we remove that part of the stomach when we do a sleeve. So doing a sleeve really means removing that part of the stomach. We're not putting in a sleeve. Some people think the sleeve means you're putting in a sleeve. We're not actually putting anything in, okay? And so the, the stomach is made smaller. And I think we have a slide later, so I'll explain this better to you. And then the second one is the ruin y gastric bypass, where we rerouted things. And we haven't removed anything. So, you know, contrary to common um, belief, you know, with a, with a bypass, we don't actually remove anything. We reroute things. And with a sleeve, we remove part of the stomach and we don't put anything in. But the band is a foreign body, which is the third, the third picture on that slide. Now, um, and that shows, you know, how we put a belt in the upper part of the stomach and that's the band. Next one. Okay, so this explains to you what a sleeve is. You can see the part that is removed. Can you roll the arrow there? Yes. Okay, so we remove that part of the stomach when we do a sleeve. That part of the stomach secretes a hormone called ghrelin. So when we remove it, two things happen. You have a smaller stomach, so you eat much less and you feel full because the stomach is smaller, plus you're not secreting ghrelin, which is the hormone that controls hunger. So that really reduces cravings in a big way. So patients, after they've had a sleeve, will eat one fourth of what they were eating before, and they'll feel satisfied. 
and they won't have the cravings as much at least. One of the good things about the sleeve is that the anatomy remains unchanged. So we haven't changed anything other than making the stomach smaller. So we haven't rerouted the intestines. We haven't put any foreign bodies in. So this results in the sleeve being a procedure that's really zero maintenance. You know, once we do a sleeve, we don't have to then, um, you know, go back and do things to it like we would have to when we did a band, where the bands have to be adjusted or in a bypass because we've rerouted things. The fact that we've rerouted um, the intestines results in new problems that could potentially occur. While with the sleeve, we don't have any of those issues because it's the normal stomach, you know, in the normal place. The other thing is, is the intestines that absorb the nutrients. And because we haven't done anything to the intestines, we're doing a sleeve results in, um, you know, no issues with malnutrition or anything, except, you know, the possibility of some um, reduction in, in intrinsic factor, we call it production that can affect B12. But in general, we don't see um, any significant malnutrition issues with sleeves. Next one. And that just shows what that we do the sleeve with the small incisions and we can see everything on a TV screen. And then we can, uh, uh, then we can, you know, make the stomach smaller that way. This just shows you what we do diagrammatically. Um, and then we'll show, I'll actually show you a real video of a sleeve. There we go. So that part is removed when we do a sleeve. Then we put it in a bag and we can remove it through one of the small incisions. Go to the next one, please. Next one. Okay, and a lot of patients have small hiatal hernias and when they have these hiatal hernias, it causes acid reflux. So the, the picture on your right shows you the hiatal hernia. The picture on your left shows the normal anatomy. So the part of the stomach that moves up into the chest, yes, that's the hiatal hernia. So doing a sleeve, um, while we're doing a sleeve, we also pull that part down and we fix the hiatus, we call it. That means we reduce the hiatal hernia and we fix it. We can do that at the same time as we're doing a sleeve. Next one. And then there's the gastric bypass. In the gastric bypass, notice that, you know, the intestine has been brought up and joined to the upper part of the stomach. So you can see that joint there, that in the upper part, that's not normal. And see how the upper part of the stomach has been separated from the lower part of the stomach. Yes, exactly, there, right there. So food cannot go from the upper part into the lower part of the stomach, but food goes from the upper part straight into the intestine. So this is why it's called a bypass because the lower part of the stomach has been bypassed. Notice when this happens, two things would happen. Number one, that's is from the lower part of the stomach. So the acid cannot go up. So for patients who have severe acid reflux, this would resolve their acid reflux completely. That would be one big advantage of having a bypass. And the second advantage is in patients with severe diabetes, especially those that are on significant amounts of insulin, those kind of patients are specifically benefited more with the bypass than with the sleeve because there's there, when no food goes into the proximal part of the intestine, which means the first part of the intestine, when no food goes in there, it improves insulin resistance, which means it allows your own insulin to work better. Next one. And uh, next one. And then um, the bypass, the sleeve, especially these two operations are recommended for patients with diabetes. Next one. And then there's the gastric bypass is done in the same way as we do the sleeve with the same small incisions. And then we can do all the, all the surgery with the small incisions. Here we're separating the upper part of the stomach where we're doing a bypass. And then we're going down to the intestine. We're bringing this loop of intestine up and we're joining it to the stomach and then joining the intestine back. And that's a gastric bypass there. Notice we're not removing anything. We're just rerouting things. The part of the stomach that remains remains completely healthy because it gets its, gets its blood supply from the surrounding tissue. Next one. And then there's the band. We don't recommend the band anymore. There was a time we were doing bands and bypasses. We didn't have any sleeves. So we had to either do the band or the bypass. And for, for many patients, the bypass was too severe in operation. So we would do the band for those patients. But currently, 
I mean, we do very few bands because now we have the sleeves and the sleeves are much more effective and, um, and, um, and much more, uh, much more user friendly. And really they have zero maintenance compared to the, to the bands. So we really do very few bands at present. Next one. And it's done with the same small incisions. Next one. We won't spend too much time with bands because we're not doing that many of them. And if anyone's interested in that, we could talk about it at a later time. Bands do need to be adjusted, which means that the, they have to be just right. They can't be too tight or too loose. Otherwise, patients are throwing up. We don't have that problem of regurgitation or throwing up with bypasses and sleeves. But with bands, it's very common. Next one. And bands need adjustments. Sleeves and bypasses don't. Next one, next one, next one. Okay, and for patients who already have a band, there are other potential options. If the band isn't working, we take the band out and we can do a sleeve, or we could take the band out and do a bypass. And for patients who already have a sleeve, they could potentially uh, be converted, especially if they're getting acid reflux to a bypass, and then they'll have zero acid reflux. It also helps with weight loss. And then patients who already have a bypass, most of them are best served with, you know, uh, seeing the nutritionist and trying to use their tool better. However, there are options for patients whose pouch is extremely dilated, et cetera. We could do things to, to change that. And for patients who've had bypasses many, many years ago, um, I mean, more than 15, 20 years ago, then the bypass that was being done at that time is different from the bypass we do today. So there is a possibility of, uh, you know, lengthening the, the degree of the bypass. That means making the intestinal length more in order to bypass more intestine. However, this has to be weighed against the potential risks of any such intervention. Next one, please. And then this just shows you the long-term outcomes after a bypass 10 to 13 years later. You could see in the first two years, patients lose most of their weight. You can see they've lost about 70% of their excess body weight. And then 10 years out, they've lost about 60% of their excess body weight. So there's a weight regain of about 10% or so. And that's normal. That's expected. So most patients will lose. So I'd say when we do sleeves and bypasses, we find that most patients you know, can lose the majority of their weight and keep it off. However, most patients do regain a little bit. It's rare for anybody to regain all the weight they've lost. And um, uh, it's not that it doesn't happen, but it's pretty rare and they're doing something wrong. They need to be uh, helped, you know, in order to use their tool better. And for those, you know, they need to go back and see the doctor, you know, who did their surgery or if your, your surgery was done with someone else, then you could come and see us and we'll see if we can help you. Next one. And then I do most of my bariatric operations today with the help of the robot. I introduced bariatric robotic surgery. Um, I was one of the pioneers of robotic bariatric surgery in the United States. And currently I do speak all over the world on robotic bariatric surgery. Um, I have presented in Oxford, in London, our technique of surgery. I presented that in Lyon, France, and we got the first prize for that uh, technique of uh, robotic sleeve gastrectomy. So uh, currently I do about 90% of my, my uh, bariatric surgeries robotically. Um, doing it robotically means I'm still doing the surgery. It just means that I'm using the robot as a puppet I'm controlling it more like a puppet. So I'm controlling the robotic arms. It allows me to see things with greater precision and work with greater precision. Next one. And you see there, when I'm looking inside that box, I can see inside the patient's abdomen. And when I move my hands, those movements are happening inside the patient's abdomen. I'll give you an example. Next one. And this shows you we're doing a bypass over here. This was with the older robot. It was called the... Uh, um, it was called the SI robot, which had the smaller arms. I'm controlling those arms and doing all that suturing there. The robot isn't doing the suturing, it's me doing the suturing, but I'm using those arms of the robot to accomplish this. You can see the movements happening down when I'm watching through that console are happening inside the patient's abdomen. Next one. And here I'll show you when I'm doing a sleeve. So this is a robotic assisted sleeve with a repair of a hiatal hernia. So you can see that part that I'm holding with my left hand, um, that is, um, that's called the greater curvature of the stomach. And I'm separating that 
from the omentum, that instrument that I'm using to cut is actually a very, uh, is a very um, versatile instrument which burns and cuts at the same time. So because of that, you don't see any blood loss when, when I do this. In fact, I can do a whole sleeve and patients will often lose between five and 10 cc's of blood with a whole sleeve, less than you would for a blood draw. And uh, here we're separating um, the greater momentum from the greater curvature of the stomach. You can see the heart beating there at around 12 o'clock. And there just below the 12 o'clock position is the spleen. And these instruments allow us to do these things. This is fascinating. We love doing this. And, um, you know, be, because it gives you so much precision, you can do things precisely exactly what you want to do and with minimal um, damage to surrounding tissues. That's intestine peristalsing, which means asking for food there. And here I'm repairing a hiatal hernia, which means that you can see the, the thing in the middle is the, is the esophagus or the food tube. And just below that is the hiatus. And I'm closing that hiatus. You can see the arrow is being pointed there, the mouse. Um, there I'm closing the hiatus, which means now this will prevent acid reflux. And uh, yeah, you can see that's been completed. And now I'm putting a bougie. You can see a tube that's being introduced. And then now I'm going to divide the stomach. This is the robotic stapler that I've just introduced. And it's a, it's a very advanced instrument that with computer guidance can, can decide the degree of pressure on the staples and can give you a perfect staple line. As you can see that staple line. Now those staples are made of titanium. They're extremely fine. You cannot really see them or on x-rays and you know they don't show up on anything. They don't show up on the, um, you know, in the airport or anything like that. And they're very, uh, they, they're really, they get incorporated in the tissue. We don't have to remove them because they get incorporated in the tissue. So the, on the left of your screen is the part of the stomach that's staying and we call that the sleeve. And on the right of the screen is the part that we're going to be removing. We put that in a bag and then we can remove it through the small incisions, sometimes through the belly button. This procedure takes me about 45 minutes. We keep you overnight, you go home in the morning. Usually you're drinking uh, protein drinks and soup and broth right away. And then we gradually advance your diet. You're walking around right away. And most patients can return to work, you know, in a few days, now some, you know, we say, we do recommend taking a week off. And if your work is really, really strenuous physically, then you need to take off three weeks. But people who sit at a desk and things like that, usually for them, a week is enough. And uh, just shows you how many robotic cases I've done. I've done about 2000 robotic um, bariatric operations, and we've had very good results as I've shown you here. Next one. And, um, and, you know, we actually do the largest number of robotic bariatric surgeries in Long Island and the five boroughs of New York. We were given that information by the company that makes the robot. And, um, and uh, we were the first uh, program in New York State to be designated a center of excellence in robotic surgery. Um, and, um, you know, we have, uh, we are an epicenter. Next one. We're an epicenter in robotic bariatric surgery, which means surgeons come from all over the world to observe me doing these operations. I had a surgeon visit from London just before COVID. And uh, in April of last year, I was supposed to go to, to London to do the first robotic uh, bariatric operation in London. Um, and um, But then COVID came. So since then, they've had three lockdowns. And so we haven't gotten around to doing that yet. Um, but what, uh, but you know, it's really fascinating. And then there are other things that are in the horizon and, and some things that are already here. So the endoscopic balloon, just wanted to say a few words about that. The endoscopic balloon is something that we do in endoscopy and we can place a balloon in the stomach. This is supposed to make you feel full because it takes up space. However, the reality is that uh, it doesn't work very well, you know? So, I, I mean, although I'm certified to do balloons, I don't, usually recommend them 
because um, and because firstly patients have to pay for this themselves and the balloon is only can only be left in for six months after that it can be serious there can be serious problems if we leave it in so if i give you a tool and then i took that tool away after six months do you think that it would work for you for the rest of your life and in general the answer is no so for most, most patients the balloon is not a good option next one and that just shows how you can do an endoscopy and leave a balloon in the stomach. As I said, it's not covered by insurances and it has to be removed in six months. Next one. Now there are balloons that you can swallow. They still have to be removed in six months and they have the same issues of insurance coverage as well as, um, as, well as the fact that you know when they're removed then patients usually gain all the weight back. Next one. And then there are other things that are in the horizon. There's a thing, something called the endoluminal sleeve, but I think this is, uh, um, you know, it's not in, in general use yet, so we don't need to necessarily, you know, elaborate on that. So let's go to the next one. Next one. Next one. Next one. Next one. Next one. Yep. Those were actually not for this presentation. Those were for uh, not the patient presentation. So let's keep going. Okay, next one. Mm. Okay, so the other question is what about pregnancy? So pregnancy after weight loss surgery is possible. And in fact, you know, weight loss surgery improves the the results of pregnancy so firstly it makes it more likely for the patients to get to to get pregnant and remain pregnant and it improves the pregnancy for the baby as well as for the mother so we do recommend waiting for about a year for most patients um, year and a half for bypass patients after uh, surgery before they try to get pregnant next one and most of the comorbidities improve or, or resolve completely. Type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, sleep apnea, gastroesophageal reflux. Next one. And uh, there's a resolution of high blood pressure in 75% of patients, resolution of diabetes in the majority of patients, and acid reflux. Next one. I just wanted to show you some figures of how many cases I've done and what problems we've had. So we've done... Um, at Mather, I've done about 7,300 cases. In this community, since 2001, I've done about 7,872 cases, as you can see. I was scrubbed in each and every one of them. Some of them were done with my partners, and uh, but I was actually scrubbed in each one of them. The bypass is about 2,000 and 4,400 sleeves and 1,363 bands. Next one. And that just shows you our volume. That means the number of cases that we've had at different years. So in 2008, I started this program in 2004. So I'm not showing you the volume before that, but in 2008, it was 260. In 2018, we did 850 cases just in that one year. And then the following year, we did about 750. Um, and, um, and then the, even with COVID, we did about 600 cases last year. Next one. And that shows you the breakdown of the types of cases. So in 2012, we were doing more bands, bypasses, and sleeves almost equally. And then 2019, which is at the bottom right of your screen, you can see that we did a lot. 83% of our cases were sleeves and about 12% were bypasses. Next one. I just wanted to show you some before and after pictures. So that is Richard. He's 440 pounds. That's in my life. There were so many things I couldn't do. I couldn't exercise, I couldn't bike ride, I couldn't go out on my boat. Today, I can do all those things and do them with a passion. And this is another patient I did a bypass on. I've been overweight since uh, 1998 and I've lost uh, 210 pounds. I have an eight-year-old daughter who wanted to play and uh, I had no energy to keep up with her. Now every Sunday we play soccer. It makes me happy and her happy. Before I had the surgery, when I was overweight, I couldn't do much of anything. I didn't feel good about myself, so I really avoided social situations. Now, I look forward to them. It's just opened up a whole new vista for me. And um, yeah, so this is another lady I did a bypass on.
Uh, this is a, a girl who was about 24 years old when I did her surgery and she had diabetes and sleep apnea. And then here's um, a year after I did a bypass on her. And then I did a bypass for her boyfriend as well. Um, this is a, a lady I did a, a band on. And then what you can see six years later, that's 2013. And then the band slipped and I converted it to a bypass. Next one. This is the lady I did a bypass on. This is the lady we did a bypass on. Today we would do a sleeve on her because in the younger people we now do sleeves. This is a family did a sleeve, bypass, sleeve and sleeve. And you want to see them four years later. And that's four years later. And um, this is a gentleman I did a bypass on. I actually do see him from time to time still and he looks fantastic. Uh, this is so. Uh, the sleeve. Next one. Next one. This is a lady I did a bypass on in 2007, and that's seven years later. Next one. These are two brothers uh, who had a sleeve, and that's one year after a sleeve. And, um, yeah. Okay, so this is a lady I did a bypass on, and that um, you can see that that panis, yes, that doesn't go away from surgery. In fact, that becomes a little bit bigger. So here, that's removed by plastic surgery, and she's had that removed in the picture on the right. And here she's skydiving because the surgery really liberates here. Next one, and it's recommended by top medical societies. Next one. And our program is more than a center of excellence. You know, we, uh, we, we were a center of excellence in 2007. The kind of results that we have in our program, I think you won't see anybody sharing their results like that with you. We've also been a robotic center of excellence since, um, oh, I don't remember even which year that was, but we were the first one in New York State. Next one. 2016. Okay. And then we're also the directorship of uh, a lot of these things. Next one. And we're also the cutting edge of this surgery. Um, and um, next one. And we also publish, uh, we're at the top of this in research and publications. Those are some of our publications. And those. And those. Um, this is a publication that we had in Surgical Endoscopy, one of our top journals comparing robot on robotic surgery. And next one. And this comparing the robotic versus the laparoscopic ruin by gastric bypass. Next one. And we presented, I presented our technique of sleeve gastrectomy in Lyon, France, and we got the first prize for that presentation. And we presented in other places. Next one. We have a lot of support post-operatively. We have six dietitians, insurance specialists, psychologists, patient support groups. Next one. And next one. Okay, so I'd like to take questions. If you have any questions for me, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you, Dr. Ahmad, for your extremely informative presentation. That was great. Um, like he said, if anybody does have any questions, you can enter them in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Um, we do have a couple coming in. So once a candidate has lost the required weight to qualify for bariatric surgery, are they encouraged to continue their weight loss journey uh, in order to forego the surgery? Yes. So most of the patients who are candidates for surgery have already tried many, many times to lose weight and they lose it and they gain it back. So uh, what we so once they make a decision to go ahead with surgery, they've already been through that cycle of losing weight and gaining it back. So if they lose weight just before surgery, and then it comes to a point that they don't qualify for surgery anymore, then the insurance companies will not cover it at that point, you see. So then it becomes a, a difficult situation for the patient who's trying to make his health better by by going ahead with surgery so that he can get a, a more 
long lasting solution of the health problem. And now we'll find that that cannot get covered. So yes, I mean, they do have the option of at that point continuing to try to lose weight, but the usual history of that situation without the intervention of surgery is that that weight usually returns. I've had an ileostomy five months ago at Mather. I've been told I need to lose 40 more pounds in order to do a J pouch. I still yes. have my sigmoid colon and rectum, which are highly diseased. Are any of these procedures an option for me? Yes, it depends on your, on your BMI. So if your height and weight ratio is such that, uh, you know, you can go to my website or Mather's website and get your BMI. If your BMI is more than 40, then you're a candidate for surgery. Um, and then I'd like to assess you and look at your individual case and try to determine whether surgery is right for you or not. Um, if your BMI is less than 40, but it's more than 35 and you have diabetes, sleep apnea, or hypertension, then it would be covered. Important thing to consider is that even if we think that you're a candidate, if your insurance company doesn't cover it, it'll be very hard to get it done. And they, they're quite inflexible in what they cover and what they don't cover. It doesn't go by... It doesn't go by what's medically necessary. They, they'll say, yes, we understand it's medically necessary, but we don't cover it at that weight. So the first thing you have to check is, um, you know, what your BMI is. If it's more than 40, then you should be fine. Then you should come and see me and I'll look at it, everything and decide whether surgery is the best option for you or not. How long is typical hospitalization for any of these procedures? So for the sleeve, the procedure takes about 45 minutes. We keep you overnight. You go home in the morning. For a bypass, we keep you two nights. Uh, any other questions, please feel free to enter them. Dr. Ahmad, why don't you walk everybody through the process of, um, do they need a referral to make an appointment with you? Um, how long does it typically take to have the surgery once you are first seeing the patient? Yes, so no referrals are necessary in most cases. Now that also varies with insurance companies. Some insurance companies do need a referral, but. Um, like you would for any other doctor. If, you, if your plan requires a referral by your primary care to see any other doctor, then that, you know, if you need a specialist referral, then you will. If your plan doesn't require a specialist referral for anything else, then you wouldn't need it for bariatric surgery referral. Uh, in terms of how long does it take? So there was a time where most insurance companies were requiring a mandatory uh, period of about six months before they would, you know, cover the surgery. But most insurance companies don't need that anymore. But on an average, it still takes about two or three months to get everything done. It can be done faster. It depends on how quickly you get everything, you know, all the tests done. I want, I, like Emily said, you know, I'd like to walk you through the process. So the first step would be, you would see uh, the surgeon, which would be, you know, um, one of us or our team. I actually see every patient that comes to our practice along with one of my partners or more. And then, um, and then you would see the nutritionist and you would see the psychologist. And um, one of us would do an endoscopy on you. And then we need a clearance from a heart doctor, which would be the cardiologist. Patients who have sleep apnea, you know, they have to make sure they're using their machine and that it's in good working condition. And patients who don't, have, don't know that they have sleep apnea, but they probably do, they'll need to get a sleep study. And we determine that when we see you on our first visit. If you need a sleep study, then that can take some time to get everything in place because after that you need the, the machine to be at home and you need to start using it and getting used to it. So that process, the whole thing can take about two or three months, maybe even longer in some cases. There is a minority of insurance companies that want monthly waits for six consecutive months and those patients will need to take longer, but that's a minority at present. When you make your first appointment, I'll have all that information ready for you. You don't have to call and find out because I'll have it for you. And I'll be able to tell you all those things based on your individual case. That's great. Um, have you had certain cases where um, medical issues like diabetes and um, you know managing certain chronic health issues have kind of gone out the window or medication might not be needed any longer? Yes. So uh, in fact, that's the majority. That's the typical situation. Most patients who are diabetic, after I do a bypass, the diabetes goes away. And with the sleeve, it improves markedly or goes away in many patients. Now there's some return of diabetes after many years, or sometimes four or five years, but it's not to the same degree like it was before. Most patients have resolution of diabetes, high blood pressure, acid reflux in the case of the bypass, 
And, um, you know, a, a lot of the things, sleep apnea resolves in the majority of patients, I'd say 90% of patients who have obstructive sleep apnea related to their weight. So once they lose the weight, all those things go away. And lastly, after you do one of these surgeries on one of your patients, how often do you have follow-up with them? Yes, so we recommend that patients see us for follow-up every four weeks for as long as they want, you know? So we do, we do strongly recommend it for the first two years, but we do recommend it for as long as they want. We are available for follow-up, we recommend it. We have a whole team of people, you know, who are there to follow up with them. So our program has uh, a number of nutritionists that work with us and as well as the surgeons, as well as we have two psychologists. Um, they're actually social workers who, um, you know, help with the psychological assessment, evaluation and follow up. Okay, great. We'll give it just a couple seconds. Uh, if anybody has any further questions, feel free to enter them at the bottom of your screen. In the meantime, thank you, Dr. Ahmad, for taking the time to present with us. That was a very informative presentation. Um, if you have any questions you don't feel comfortable asking online, you can email them to us at matherhospital at northwell.edu, and we'll definitely pass them along to Dr. Ahmad and get an answer for you. Once you exit the webinar, you'll be redirected to complete a brief survey. If you could please complete that, it helps us plan our future webinars and, you know, give you guys what you want to hear. Um, if you'd like to view previous Healthy You content, you can find that on our website at www.matherhospital.org slash Healthy You. That's you as in university. Thanks for joining us today. And Dr. Ahmad, it looks like we've pretty much wrapped up. So thank you for your time today. Okay, you're welcome. It's my pleasure. Look forward to seeing you. Great. Bye-bye. Okay.